you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. We return to the realm of the poltergeist today in the company of author and investigator John Fraser. As a member of the Society for Psychical Research, ASAP, and also a former vice chair of the Ghost Club, John has been involved in the investigation and collation of numerous accounts, hauntings, poltergeists and strange things all across the United Kingdom and beyond. John's most recent book, Poltergeist, A New Investigation into Destructive Haunting, is one of my favourite released on this topic in the last few years, and I highly recommend it. John and I discuss some numerous and notorious hauntings from the United Kingdom and beyond in our discussion as we ponder what are poltergeists and some of the most famous cases the UK has had to offer. Don't forget, you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Mysteries and Monsters is on all social media platforms. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube, and you can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, and Mysteries and Monsters merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestor for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Store of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now... Let's join John Fraser as we unpeel the conundrum that is the poltergeist phenomena. We return to the realm of the paranormal in the company of author and investigator John Fraser. With a long supernatural CV, John was formerly the vice chair of the Ghost Club and is currently on the Council of the Society of Psychical Research. John, I am delighted to welcome you to Mysteries and Monsters. It's a pleasure to be here, Paul. If you think the um, uh, Society for Psychical Research is difficult to say, <laughs> there is another There is another organisation that I'm a member of known as the Association for the Scientific Study of Anonymous Phenomena, yeah. who... Who for, who, for quite obvious reasons, call themselves ASAP. Yes, I always refer to them as ASAP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly saves us putting us teeth in, I'll certainly say that. Despite the fact that I've been interested in the paranormal for 40 years at least, I still trip up over that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, John, you're, you're someone whose work I've got to know over the last sort of decade or so. Uh, through your work in, in writing articles for the 14 Times and other interviews you've done with uh, other online presences and shows over the years, as well as your your marvellous book that came out a couple of years ago, Poltergeist, A New Investigation into Destructive Haunting. How on earth did you fall into this field of passion in the supernatural, John? Because you're one of those people, I, I, I should be very jealous, really, that... Um, You've you had the uh, the wonderful honour of, of meeting Peter Underwood, which is one of my paranormal heroes. Yes, I'm. Uh, yes, I'm still a member of the Ghost Club, and um, uh, um, other members kind of joke that I think I'm the only person still around that got signed up by Peter Underwood, and in, <laughs> in the days when it was. Um, probably not a good idea, but it was by invite only. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's actually. Slightly long, um, I'll give you the abridged version, but quite interesting story of how I did get involved. I mean, like most of us, um, of a certain age at least, I don't know if you're of that certain age or not, um, but I um, uh, I was brought up in Peter Underwood books and others, um, a chap called Anthony D. Hipsley Cox. Um, mm. I, was ac- I was absolutely fascinated as a teenager that... Um, uh, that having watched horror films and what have you, that um, people actually took the paranormal seriously. I, up until then, I just thought it was something you made films about to sort of scare teenagers in the dark. <laughs> and um, so basically, I read all the books and um, uh, 
and as soon as I was able, I went out to um, uh, try and join these august organizations. I actually probably joined ASAP first when I was probably about 17 or 18. Um, so that must have been at least 10 years ago. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the, the Ghost the Club was a funny one because when I'd been reading all these um, all these all these ghost books. Um, I was particularly interested in hauntings that felt like hauntings, you know, places where if you went, you were trapped for the night in, you know, rather than your average haunted supermarket, which whilst for uh, research purposes is probably equally valid, probably just doesn't give you the same sense of romance. Mm. So I actually, um, um, when I was in Scotland for a comfort political youth conference, believe it or not, I actually took the opportunity to keep driving up to a place called Sandwood Bay, which is a remote beach um, uh, uh, at least three miles from the nearest road um, where there is a cottage supposed to be haunted by a sailor. And just for the heck of it, I decided to spend the night all alone now by myself with camera. Um, uh, and I'm um, uh, not quite sure what I was expecting to find. <laughs> uh, but um, Sandwood Bay is surrounded by um, shifting sands and peat bogs. So, you know, once you're there, you are truly there for the night. You probably <laughs> couldn't get home, especially as I left my torch in the restaurant. <laughs> So I, I spent the night there, um, uh, initially a little bit jumpy, um, actually tried to burn a copy of um, an Elliot O'Donnell book in the in the fireplace just for a bit of light. That probably <laughs> reflects my thoughts on Elliot O'Donnell as well. <laughs> Maybe talk about that a little yes. bit more later. <laughs> and... Some interesting non-phenomena, um, which kind of educated me in how you can sort of perceive things. Um, uh, shift, shifting white mounds on the top of the hills, which turned out to be sheep, and the reflection of a light, um, which was actually the Cape Wrath lighthouse. And when you realised it was coming quite consistently, you kind of relaxed. And I spent actually an amazing night there. Um, uh, right in the very tip of Scotland. Now, the interesting twist is afterwards, I, I did do quite a bit of research into the actual case and found there was a bothy about a mile up the road, um, uh, or non-road because there's no roads up there, um, which was actually inhabited by a guy called James McRory Smith, hmm. um, uh, who was basically a hermit from Glasgow. And the interesting thing is James McRory Smith was the spitting image of the haunt of the sailor that was supposed to haunt the bothy in the beach. Um, so we suddenly have a working hypothesis into what the so-called ghost might have been. And I basically collated all the experiences, spoke, spoke to some of the locals, found out a few new twists, and, um, and um, as as Mr Underwood had been. Um, writing about this in the past and had also got some um, case notes from people that had written to him. I swapped notes with him. And then I got a letter coming back asking if I might be interested in joining the Ghost Club. So I joined the Ghost Club. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a few later I joined the SPR, which um, uh, kind of set me off to where I am today. I mean... Mm. I mean, it's, I kind of come from it from a kind of what, what if scenario. I'm not particularly psychic. Um, I've only had one or two slight experiences, um, but there's enough people out there who have had enough strange things happening in them to them not to kind of discount it or try to put some very weird, simplistic psychological theory on on the paranormal. So. I kind of um, I'm fascinated by the possibility, uh, but without going there from any particular belief-led um, system of investigation. Hmm. I, I, I know, as you mentioned there, Elliot O'Donnell is is notorious to say the least, John. And I kind of I kind of know exactly where you're going with this in a moment. But 
Do you think as Peter Underwood fell into this trap occasionally with some of the, his books, I know there are some other um, well-held historical collections of paranormal events from certain areas of the UK where on investigation, a lot of them are friend of a friend stories, they're myths, folklore, they're legends. There's no actual basis in reality for some of these hauntings. And it seems that from the early early part of the, the 20th century up until the modern era, it would seem now, it seems to be getting increasingly difficult to unpick everything in regards to the reality of certain alleged and famous hauntings, John? Oh, I I totally agree. I mean, I certainly wouldn't put Peter in the same light as Elliot O'Donnell, who mm. who seemed to... Well, Elliot, Elliot, Mr. Mr. O'Donnell claimed to be a descendant of Niall of the is it the nine lives of the nine tails basically the irish king arthur yes. um uh, provided no proof for that whatsoever <laughs> um uh, he if you read his books they're quite a fun read but um uh, he does tend to see see about five ghosts before breakfast and they all they are they're all bl- <laughs> they're all they're all shapes with um blobless heads and bulging eyes um uh, and <laughs> i believe I'd have to check this, but I've heard rumours that um, people have actually tried to get hold of his background notes and come to the conclusion that he didn't have any. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so he he wrote a good yarn. Some of some of his um, uh, some some of his his re- some of his um, ghost stories are based on other people's. Uh, that's possibly the similarity with um, some of Peter's cases. Hmm. I mean, to be fair, I mean uh, Peter Underwood or other people around that time um, didn't always claim to have thoroughly researched them. I'll give you a good example of that. Um, Peter and a few other authors talk about um, a place called. Igtham Moot um, in Kent, which is apparently haunted by Dame Dorothy Selby, who was apparently a Catholic who betrayed the gunpowder plot and was walled up in Igtham Moot. Now, that's a story I've heard less recently, but certainly during the 70s and 80s, um, Peter Andwood wasn't the only one that put it in his ghost books. It's mm. a good little ghost story. It's also got a nice little twist that a skeleton was found in the late 19th century in the um, uh, foundations of the building. Mm. However, Dame Dorothy Selby um, can be found about a mile down the road in St. Peter's Church, Igtham, where she was um, buried in, I think it was 1642, died of septicemia, possibly while sewing and pricking her finger, which is, of course, 37 years after the gunpowder plot. Yeah. Now, there's a huge mausoleum for Dame Dorothy, who was a real figure and um, uh, quite a famous figure in her time. Um, so it's quite obvious that whilst Igtham Moat might be haunted by something, it certainly isn't haunted by Dame Dorothy Selby because she was walled up in the moat, in the, in the, in the house. Um, and so, yes, yes, you're quite right. Um, stories like that do tend to fall apart when researched into. Um, sometimes stories stand up a little better. Um, I mean, the Sandwood Bay one I was talking about, um, uh, the most of the original so- sources go back to a local folklorist who actually went around interviewing people, so has first-hand interviewed evidence, but nevertheless didn't necessarily look at it critically. For example, one of the main witnesses of the Sam Wood Bay sailor was a chap called Sandy Gunn, who apparently never washed and was also famous for seeing a mermaid. I'm not going to. I'm not going to discount mermaids, but nevertheless, um, had I been having that interview, I might have been a little bit um, uh, 
you know, are probed into Sandy Gunn's belief syndromes yes. and possibly even made sure I sat on the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, if he was uh, ad- adverse to uh, yeah. personal yeah. hygiene, John, yeah, that's not an interview you want to do on a hot summer's day. No, so. it was, it, I mean, to be fair, as I understand it, it was one of these old school shepherds that lived in a bossy without running yeah. water and so on and so on. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, uh, set, setting that aside, um, um, we, we, have, we have witness evidence for this, but we don't have... We don't have um, the sort of investigator probed witness evidence to, um, but uh, nevertheless, Sam would be a, a lot more factually correct than say Ixam Moot, mm. and there's quite a few do hit the category of Ixam Moot. Mm. Should we? I would ask the question: uh, Should we stop reporting them? I mean, there's an even there's an even better one. Um, uh, uh, Lady Loverbond, Goodwin Sands, Kent. Um, uh, supposed to, again, reported by Andrew, but others as well. Um, uh, supposed to have been a ship that ran aground in the Goodwin Sands in 1748. It was supposed to be a wedding party. Um, the uh, the bride was having an affair with the um, first mate in the ship, big argument, uh, but ran aground, everyone drowned. Now, first flaw in that, if everyone drowned, how do we know the story? Second flaw in that is um, at one point I thought I'd just ask for Lloyd Shipping Register 1750 to 18, sorry, um, 1700 to 1750, which my local lending library looked aghast, but they did get it for me. <laughs> um, uh, there is no Lady Loverborn, never sank. Mm. Um, Lloyd, you know, no insurance claims, nothing. However, if I'm still around, I am going to be there. I, I nearly went there in 1998, but I couldn't for some reason. Apparently, 300 ghost, ghost hunters from all over the world packed out Dealing Kent, which is the closest town, and rented, rented boots to go out and have a look for it. And um, if I'm still around in 2048, um, I'm definitely going to do the same. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to explore the romance of the subject as well. So there's no reason these stories shouldn't be told but maybe they should be told with a little public health warning at the bottom <laughs> yes. yes well i know as, as we've 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 mentioned him a couple of times o'donnell now correct me if i'm wrong here probably most people will be aware indirectly of o'donnell for one particular haunting which is which is notorious because it essentially never happened which is berkeley square john was that o'donnell that promoted that particular strand that he basically had one version of it and by the end of his career the, the story had completely changed from my recollection of berkeley square um o'donnell wrote about it but didn't primarily invent it i was doing a little bit of research of these nongo stories for my for my latest book which will maybe mention later but um, uh, funnily enough I I had a quick look into Berkeley Square Berkeley Square uh, 10 Berkeley Berkeley Square is a lovely place anyone who's been up there posh end of Mayfair it was in Victorian times apart from one house which was um, owned by somebody who didn't maintain it I think rarely lived in it and it got horrendously overgrown and I think um, various stories actually started from the Penny Dreadfuls Hmm. which included um, so, um, soldiers spending the night there, um, throwing themselves out and getting impaled on the railings. I think O'Donnell simply regurgitated that, um, either knowingly or unknowingly. Um, I mean, he I don't think he was the sole co- cause of Berkeley Square. Um, again, I mean, I think at one point it nearly had the most haunted house in England tag, but yes. um, uh, it was just based... As I understand it, on on a very creepy looking house and um, uh, a bit of chit chat from the upper classes, which got its way into the penny dreadfuls. <laughs> Do you look at, at, at as someone whose whose paranormal career has, has, has straddled several decades, John? Do you look at how we've kind of gone through this sort of? entertainment prism in regards to the paranormal being covered on on television because i know in your in in your book that came out a couple of years ago that i mentioned 
You mentioned somebody I used to absolutely love watching every time he was on television throughout the, the 80s and 90s, which was Tony Cornell, um, mm. because I found him a very balanced and methodical investigator. And primarily, he was very good at debunking a lot of cases, but also debunking a lot of sceptical arguments in regards to such things as poltergeist phenomenon. Do you think that we miss that kind of studious investigator being out there, to, that we've gone to this more sort of extreme entertainment version of it, which has a very loose grasp on the word investigation? Well, certainly we we miss them on TV. Um, uh, I mean, I'd say the last journalistic, albeit albeit with a light touch, but serious journalistic program was probably Lionel Farnsorts in the um, uh, in the in the late nineteen nineties. Um, um, I mean, we had a series of programs in the nineteen nineties that, well journalistic investigations into into haunted places and then suddenly we got the most haunted format which is fine up to a point but then it seems to have got replicated all over the world and everybody every time anyone wants to make a program about ghosts it's on the same format nervous people in haunted houses scaring themselves (laughs) <laughs> and, um, I mean, I've got no problems with any one of those programs per se, so long as they don't fake phenomena, which is another matter. Yes. Um, but, I mean, for, for goodness sake, um, there must be – it's a bit like it's a bit like having only one type of um, uh, feature film, you know, um, continually showing one type of war film and then one foot war film being based in exactly the same format as the next. I mean – I think, I think if we had a, a a serious journalistic program presented in a in a you know in an entertaining way, I think it would do incredibly well. But um, we have yet to find a TV producer this side of the twenty first century to take it on. So I mean, as I say, the um, uh, the best and latest remains um, uh, the good Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, who ran for a few th- series, and I think it was Channel Four, um, and there's really been nothing since. And that has undoubtedly influenced the way some people approach ghost hunting, uh, it, because it's the only initial feedback they've got. Yeah, I think it's 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 difficult for a lot of people. I think making their first steps into investigating ghosts or hauntings these days, John, because they're expected to turn up with some kind of arsenal in a specially designed case. Whereas, you know, I've I've spoken to paranormal investigators. I know some people who will not go anywhere near any of these latest and modern gadgets, John, because to their mind, a lot of these ghost hunting devices that you can buy are designed to give you a result. They don't actually search for anything. They are just if you leave them running long enough, it will it will pick up something, and then you can leave it running, and it will once again do the same thing over and over again. With your experience, are you someone that goes with the sort of old school camera torch, pen and paper, or, or something to jot down notes these days, or have you sort of branched out and used things that may be of? Um, use in that i know one of the bits in your book when you were talking about some of these instruments that people use that made me chuckle was people saying that you needed a geiger counter and and basically said if you were somewhere where a geiger counter started going off you wouldn't be investigating that place much longer yes um that's that's true that was that was one um one chap in America that was was a ghost hunting book um, uh, and uh, that was probably um, probably slightly flippant of me actually to be (laughs) honest Um, the point oh one one first point actually I'm trying to remember what he called it Um, uh, ah yes Um, we've both got a lot of respect for Tony Cornell Uh, Mr Cornell was actually the first person to um, uh, probably bring a sophisticated ghost hunting gadget to the um uh, to the frame of investigations it um uh, was a something that 
that um, uh, in a low-tech way, because we're talking about the 1970s, 80s, um, tried to measure all kinds of things. It was actually known as SPIDER. Um, and I think the SPR still, uh, at least one of the council members of the SPR still has it. <laughs> um it was probably a little bit um, uh, sensitive in that there was, I believe there were things that could trigger it off that were would make it a little bit unreliable. But it was, I think it was only used a few times. But nevertheless, the, um, the principle was correct. Um, so long as we realize we are trying to look for atmospheric changes um, and op- and trying to find a correlation with unexplained events. Um, We are not trying to find something that detects the ghost. I mean, for example, a Geiger counter, it could actually, there could actually be a working theory, I don't know of it, um, where um, um, ghosts tend to be more prevalent in areas of um, uh, high high radiation. if you believe there was a possibility of such a theory and took a Geiger counter into every investigation you went into and you found a correlation over a period, so long as it wasn't a dangerous correlation, um, uh, you might be on to something. <laughs> but I think what I was saying is you can kind of randomize your equipment a little bit. I don't know of, of uh, any any correlation with that type of radioactivity. But there certainly is an arguable correlation between um, uh, electromagnetism and hauntings. Um, uh, one of my colleagues in the SBR, Mr. Parsons, has done quite a lot of research into this and uh, and I think had a case in Wales, a uh, confidential case, so it's just known as a case in the farmhouse in Wales, mm. um, where some poltergeist activity was taking place and the the particular room of the house where it was most prevalent was found to have very dangerous electrical wiring and very, very high EMF recordings, obviously. Um, it was same place was also found to be on a geological fault, um, which again is interesting. There's a number of cases that do seem to be on geological faults. So I do not disagree at all with taking um, um, things that measure the environment, so long as you're aware that you are only measuring the environment. Simplest one's a thermometer. That obviously Mm. measures the environment. You know, temperature, working hypothesis, so maybe temperature drops, cold spots, with ghosts, you're perfectly entitled to take it. Likewise, EMFs and... um, uh, to be honest, um, whatever theory you're trying to test, so long as you're un- aware that you are only testing a theory and not detecting a ghost. Mm. Um, the, I mean, you, you get things like spirit boxes as well, which um, I must admit I'm not an expert in, but um, uh, I mean, I think it might be designed to pick up random radio waves, so I'm not quite sure where that's getting us. Obviously, if you were using a spirit box and you asked a question and you got a coherent answer and that was repeatable, it might turn out to be an interesting tool, but I don't know of any any or many examples of that. If any of your listeners do, feel free to send me an email or Twitter or whatever. <laughs> Would you say it's kind of wrapped up in a similar phenomenon as, as EVP? Because it's one of those things, I think, over over recent years, that seems to be something that fell away completely from a lot of paranormal investigations, John. I remember a lot of people in the, in the 80s and 90s would use EVP quite a lot. It's something that very rarely seems to get mentioned, though I am aware that it seems that some people have sort of started to embrace it again, as though they're going backwards to get a a more sort of solid footing in it. Have you sort of had any experiences with that or any of your colleagues in the SPR or the Ghost Club? Was that anything that you guys gave any validity to or do you just think it's it's too easy to fake something like that? I doubt many 
EVP. We've been sent quite a few EVPs, um, especially through the the SPR. Mm. I doubt many EVPs we've sent have been faked uh, because, to be honest, if they were trying to fake them, they'd probably do a better job of making them more impressive. <laughs> um, I mean... M- Yes. I mean, there's two things about EVPs. Why, why they've probably died out. Um, there's a certain point where people, and why they'll probably come back again. There's a certain point where people get, um, have only so much time in their hands and can't listen to three and a half hours of tape recordings in the hope there might be a faint whisper in the background. Obviously, the spirit box has helped overcome that. Therefore, EVPs be- become more popular again. I mean, EVPs came from a chap called Rodiv. I've forgotten what country he comes from. He did a lot of experimentation, but kind of lost me when he started to allow sentences in what I think I think the phrase is polygot in more than one language at once. So you'd get a entity maybe starting off saying something in English and then transferring to German and so on. That kind of increases your chances of randomness. And let's face it, if we're taking the spirit theory of the paranormal, why would the spirit suddenly change languages? Um, And the examples we've been sent um, are of the type where if you listen to them, you wouldn't necessarily have a clue what was being said. But then if you opened the transcript of what the sender thought was being said, you'd kind of go, yeah, it sounds a bit like that, actually. But that is, you know, that kind of shows how if you listen to something or if you're prompted um, often enough, you can kind of make it sound what you like. I think um, uh, I think um, – the skeptic Chris French used to um, talk about how if you played Black Sabbath backwards, he used to say Satan is my friend or something if you listen to, to it often enough. And fundamental Christians thought that Black Sabbath were a bunch of Satanists because of that. So if you're going to get good EVP, it's got to be a coherent sentence and it's got to be, you know, kind of, audible first or possibly second time rather than something you keep programming your mind to kind of understand in a certain way. Now, again, um, something I've partially discounted, but um, uh, if there was such a, you know, example of EVP, um, we should still be open to it. We can't, I mean, we do not know what the paranormal is, so we shouldn't totally discount any aspect of it and sort of say, well, my paranormal's cool while your paranormal's silly, if you know what I mean, because yes. there'll always be a scientist that says both our paranormals are silly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, there is always that argument. It is peculiar sometimes that there will be, even in even in this field, John, there'll be people that will completely discount certain aspects of it because it's not their thing. Somebody, I was speaking with someone recently and we were talking about Ouija boards and somebody said, why is it that Ouija boards are classed as dangerous where all the other aspects of spiritual contact are seemed as okay, like pendulums and things? Because essentially, do you, do you think you're going through a different channel to get to these places? Because surely they're going to the, if you believe that any of them do work, they're all going to the same place. Just because you use a board doesn't mean it's a different connection than a pendulum, perhaps, or, or some other scrying or something like that. Why? That just kind of sums it all up, that they've now become this embodiment of evil, primarily based entirely on the exorcist more than anything, I suspect, than than what they were always meant to be, which was a parlor game. I, I, I suspect you're right about the exorcist. I mean... I mean, um, to be fair, I think the spiritualist theory walks along these lines. If you're using a medium, um, you've kind of got a bouncer at the door, yes. um, uh, which is a medium, um, uh, to control who you communicate with. 
if you use a Ouija board, it's a bit like leaving your front door open and you never quite know who's going to walk in. Um, so if you do take the um, uh, spiritualist view of the afterlife, I can understand why they would be wary using Ouija boards. I don't quite take that view myself, and I have used them in the past as an experiment. Um, one thing I would say is never use them if if you're being invited into somebody's home because um, uh, you'll, you've already got people that are a little bit jumpy about wh- whatever's happening to them, ghosts, poltergeist activity, what have you. And um, uh, you should never, if you like, provoke that fear. Uh, so there's something to be used in neutral territory, old castles, um, just just as an experiment. I mean, I, I've i done past life, life hypnosis, hypnosis experimentation, just as a subject and an operator, and I've... I've kind of, I've obviously been on a Ouija board and I'd actually say it's not that different from a very light form of self-hypnotism. Self so again, it's a very similar way of channeling and whatever you may or may not pick up whilst whilst in a hypnotic trance, um, you might also pick up by, um, uh, by a Ouija board, whether it's just a way of, Tuning, tuning for ESP or, or something like that. Who can tell? But if you are taking the the um, spiritualist um, uh, um, afterlife hypothesis, I can understand why people who who follow are following that hypothesis should be wary. I think, as as with anything, John, it's it's all about who's giving you the information and, and where you're sort of validating it that comes across. And I think often. It just depends on the channels that you're you're getting stuck into, really. I think often one of the things I always say, or, or when I'm speaking with with people in in the modern sort of investigations, they will tend to sort of advise people to use as many sources and cross reference and things. And I know as we were speaking earlier on about digging into the past and history, and and these days you can double check it because I'm still amazed. As we were, as we were talking about, you know, folklore and myth being put forward as fact in some of these, I'm still amazed that you will still see videos of people doing investigations in certain locations, claiming horrific murders have happened in the recent past. And you're like, well, there's no evidence for that because the, these stories are easily traceable now. We've got so many resources online for newspaper archives and court documents and things like that. That when somebody says, oh, there was a horrific murder here. The family were murdered, and then you check, and there's no evidence for that. Do you still come across those kinds of cases, John, where it's just, it's so nonsensical and easily disprovable, but people, as we were saying earlier on, people don't seem to care. They seem to have a thirst for these tales, even though it's just somebody wandering around an abandoned house. Um. Oh, yeah. I mean, we def- I, I definitely, in fact, I can think of a fairly recent one I, I've 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 come across, but 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 this was based on a well uh, a well witnessed uh, poltergeist event, stone throwing poltergeist um, uh, that went on for a number of years, and when a couple of spiritualists came to the house, um, uh, they said, "Oh, there's a well in the back garden, and there's a little boy who drowned in it, and he keeps trying to throw stones to get people's attention. No hidden well was ever found, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it kind of reminded me of um, one of my colleagues, Barry Colvin, investigated a, a case in Andover um, where the, there was definite poltergeist activity, um, but when a couple of spiritualists were brought in, um, this was because a somebody was buried in the cellar. Some elements of spiritualists do seem to revert back to the old Fox Sisters tale of somebody being buried um, uh, in the cellar, which um, for your listeners who aren't aware of it, the Fox Sisters basically were the catalyst for spiritualism and um, uh, 
and may or may not have had psychic powers. That's debatable. But um, uh, uh, but one of the stories was a peddler was buried in the cellar, um, and ever since then, um, there is numerous people buried in cellars. In <laughs> but but these are in perfectly in inverted commas, real, well-authenticated cases. It just, it just seems to provide confusion um, when you sometimes bring some spiritualists in. I think there might, as there is under hypnotism, funnily enough, be a desire to please and subconsciously come up with these stories. I doubt anyone's like walks into a house and says, oh, I'm going to, tonight it's going to be somebody buried in the cellar or something like that. Yes. Uh, you know, you walk in, there's a sense of expectation um, uh, and there's a sense of wanting to bring something up and um, uh, that possibly there is some relationship between hypnotism, um, the spirit, the state of trance and spiritualism and possibly what we do in Ouija boards. I mean, possibly there's a lot more interconnection between the paranormal than we think. I know with your book as well, John, you've mentioned previously that for you it was kind of an addition or a, a sort of sequel that you could perhaps suggest to Colin Wilson's incredible book on, on Poltergeist, and another author and researcher that I have a, a a massive amount of time for and, and another person who was a, a, a very interesting character with a with a wide variety of interests um and one of those authors you look back and you just wonder how on earth were they so prolific so was was Colin's work the the catalyst in regards to to your second book Poltergeist John or was was it something that you were just wanting to sort of make the connection because I I've it's easily one of the best books written on that particular subject. Oh, first of all, I, I I I love reading Colin Wilson. I mean, I I, I spent most of my sixth form um, uh, reading The Occult, which is about seven hundred and seventy yes. pages, which probably <laughs> yeah. probably explains my A level grades. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think of Wilson. I mean, he's 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 done a bit of paranormal research. He's 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 mainly mainly what I'd call an applied philosopher, and he'd probably he'd probably agree with me if he was still around. Um, uh, I I really I really loved the Poltergeist book. I was fascinated by the way he flipped his theories. Um, literally in the middle of that book, mm. um, from being powers within us to um, uh, being external entities, uh, because all his work prior to that, the occult mysteries and so on, was basically based on the powers within us, um, what he called Factor X, mm. um, that we somehow have amazing powers that were kind of brought out in this thing known as the occult and he suddenly changed halfway through the book so as I was revisiting the case which flipped him the black monk of Pontefract yes <laughs> I thought I'd I thought I'd make the connection with his book it was um, uh, it's definitely not a sequel it's mm. in my own style um, which I would if I had to make a comparison I'd say Colin Wilson Light I chuck a bit yes. of philosophy in, but I I, I also chuck a, a little bit of um, amusing tone of phrase as well. Um, but um, uh, it was probably that connection and the fact that I probably disagreed with him flipping his theories um, that made me make the connection in the title and, yeah, and um, spend a good part of a chapter explaining why I thought Colin Wilson was right to begin with and wrong, at least in that stage of his thought. Yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's uh, one of our most famous, being a Yorkshireman, John, it's one of our most famous hauntings and uh, includes some of my, my favourite amusing moments. If if we are led to believe everything that happened in that particular case happened, then there are some wonderfully terrifying but amusing instances that occurred. And it this this is the thing about certain poltergeist cases that 
some of them seem to be very similar, but also extremely different. Uh, obviously, we couldn't talk about Poltergeist without mentioning Enfield at all. But when you compare it to to perhaps Pontefract, you've got you know a couple of the key ingredients: family tension, pubescent children, maybe some kind of family stress underlying everything, and yet. If you look at the, if you put the cases side by side, some of the things that happened in Enfield certainly didn't happen at Pontefract, and vice versa. I mean, my, one of my favourite portions of, of Pontefract is the dancing glove incident. So, which we never got anything like that. Often, certain poltergeist cases, that kind of thing doesn't happen very often. So, I suppose, John, when you're trying to look at how things have gone when you were releasing your your book. Was it a case of not wanting to go back to too many of these particular cases that had been covered in in such in depth? Because as you say, your book covers several famous cases and and some not so well known, whereas we've tended to move away from this kind of overview of the poltergeist to focus on a particular case in the modern era. Yeah, I mean, I mean, most books are certainly written about one particular case. Um, I, I mean, what I was trying to do in the book is, is, is look for correlations. I mean, you do get these wonderful one-off incidents that, in some ways, couldn't fit any paranormal theory very well, apart from the fact, apart from the fact they apparently happened. Um, yes. Dance, you, you've got your dancing glove in Pontefract. You've got the um, uh, the gas fire, I believe, being lifted out of its fittings in Enfield. Yeah. Um, which is are amazing things that um, are very very difficult to categorize. But in most poltergeist cases, you do have at least you've got enough of the similar factors, pools pools of water, things being thrown around and so on to make to make you think we are talking about one phenomena rather than sort of lots of different ones. Um it's also quite interesting. There's very few poltergeist cases where you have any meaningful spiritual spiritual communication. Mm. They do seem to be well, not very intelligent. Black Monk of Pontefract, it's the only reason it was called a Black Monk is a very spurious connection um, uh, that a gentleman called Tom Cuniff thought he had researched that made made a gallows close to where the council house is, which is very, very disputable and possibly had a monk being hung there. Again, very, very disputable. Um, the only the only phenomena, phenomenolo- phenomenological, that's as bad as saying the SPR, um, <laughs> uh, connection is that towards the end of the phenomena, they started to see a hood a hooded figure. Mm. Now, bearing in mind there was a leprosy hospital just down the road, I'd, if there was a past life entity, I'd say it's far more likely to be a figure in a dressing gown that was suffering from some appalling disease. Uh, there was no, there was no monk connection. There was no monk communication. There was nothing saying I am a monk or anything like that. It's just um, we like to put our our little um, pigeonholes in these things. Uh, likewise, yeah. um, likewise with Enfield, you've got um, there was a gentleman, an, an elderly gentleman that died in the house that um, may have been possessing um, uh, one of the young girls. However, um, again, I will quote my friendly skeptic Chris French: um, if the gentleman Bill was indeed possessing the girl, why was he so interested in talking about periods? Because mm-hmm. a lot of this um, uh, a lot of this ghostly talk in a gruff voice was um, uh, discussing asking questions about menstruation. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> why would an old man be interested? <laughs> well, it takes all sorts, John. Um... <laughs> Indeed it does. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose as well, when, when you're collating your book, was it 
one of those situations often when you've got such a love and a experience in this particular field, John, was it harder to to decide which cases not to look at? Or did you kind of think, well, there's there's some some I have to sort of pay homage to, as it were, as well as covering some cases like you say, that the cage, the witch's prison in St. Osset, is is one of those that I think unless you've got a real interest in the paranormal, especially in the UK, most people wouldn't have been aware of that particular haunting. Well, it's 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 a fairly new case, but um, uh, um, uh, to be fair, Haunted Magazine had it in its top five for a couple of years and a few years back. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it was included because I had investigated it thoroughly. Um, uh, and, um, I mean, to be honest, um, I wrote the book when... I I looked at the piles of material, both secondhand and firsthand, that I had, and I thought, I've probably got enough of a book here. Uh, so it kind of, the material kind of selected itself, um, and I thought I would write a book to try to make sense of the material I had. So it wasn't, it 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 was in some ways self-selecting and it, it makes no claims to be exhaustive. And I kind of noticed at the end that I uh, missed out this that South, very famous case, the South Shields poltergeist, um, yes. uh, very well investigated by Darren Ritson. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was just my area of expertise of just one particular case I've never looked into in the sort of depth that I would want to write about and have any direct opinions of uh, but no in some ways it was self-selected and based on the knowledge I had at that date and the particular cases I'd investigated um, as I had spent a long time probably more researching the cage than investigating it um, uh, I thought that would have to be the one that I dedicated a chapter to and the same way as Colin Wilson dedicated a chapter to the Black Monk of Pontefract. Mm. Mm. So for anybody who's not aware of it, John, can you give us a brief synopsis about what was supposed to be going on at this particular location? Because it's it's one of those where often when we hear people who have lived with these things or lived through these things, sometimes I think we're amazed at how resilient they are. There is this kind of cliche that, well, if things are that bad, why don't you just move as if people have got thousands of pounds at their disposal to just up and leave at any given moment, John? Yeah, um, well, I mean, well, this one's clearly in the public domain. I mean, uh, so we can talk talk, talk, talk about the owners and the witnesses. Um, Vanessa, Vanessa Mitchell um, uh, bought, bought the cage early 2000s. Um, uh, she, single lady at the time, um, uh, Obviously, had the um, had the funds to buy a house. Um, it was it was known that, that it was obviously part of a village lockup, and it had this um, uh, nice, weird historical sign outside saying the cage, which is where which is were kept here in the in the in the sixteenth century, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But over and above that, um, it might have had a slight reputation for being haunted as well but nothing 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 huge you know your usual historical stuff hmm. when she mo- initially she lived there with some um, friends who were lodgers and um uh, she started seeing things which included a um an elderly lady with a bull or something which could have been possibly a witch um uh, she also saw um, uh, men from the modern era, um, but it wasn't so much the apparitions uh, because they seemed to only happen very occasionally. It was a poltergeist phenomena, which included um, cook cans sliding across a table, being pushed downstairs, um, being hit across the face in the bathroom, and um, oh, uh, numerous things like that happening. Now, the um, uh, lodgers were witnesses to some of these events, uh, but then the lodgers moved out and um, uh, circumstances changed and she actually had a young baby. And um, uh, phenomena continued. And yes, she did actually leave the house and basically move into a caravan. 
at, at one point um, and contact the SPR long before it hit the national press, mm. uh, which is why we had a fa- fairly good good link with her. Now, you ask why people stay there. Obviously, they've got they've got a mortgage. Um, l- luckily, I believe at the time she actually did she did work in the sort of cara- caravan sales industry, so she she did actually have that option. Otherwise, yeah. you do have to stay where you are. You can't just um, you 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 can't you can't just leave your home easily. Now, what I tried to do with the cage is it had been um. Whilst it was empty, it had been open to paranormal investigations. Some people saw very little. Some people had some amazing effects happening. And I actually did a research, both of the history and of all the witnesses, both those in St. Ois, um, uh, Vanessa and her friends and colleagues, and also of the people that had investigated it since, uh, basically looking for correlations of... um, uh, of phenomena hmm. and it does indeed appear to be a very strange place nothing happened while i was there um but i recorded no less than five instances i think it was of poltergeist scratchings of people coming to the place and leaving with inexplicable scratches now you know one by itself could be didn't realize I had it. Some people realized at the point, you know, sudden jarring pains in their legs and so on. So that makes it more difficult. You also had um, uh, a lot of phenomena around the staircase. Uh, Other people experiencing being pushed on, you know, uh, being pushed on the staircase. Um, Thankfully, nobody's actually fallen down full throttle. Otherwise, there, there might have been in the national press for entirely different reasons. And, the other interesting factor is now I know when people investigate a haunted house, they obviously have a heightened sense of expectation, but there was probably about four or five cases of people literally breaking down and fleeing the house. Um, now that's above average for your average haunted place. Mm. Now what I would have wanted to do, which Unfortunately, I never got a chance, was to do a full seismic and equipment survey, which is probably beyond me, to be honest, but um, I know some people that could do it, Mm. on the place uh, to actually see if it was on any geological faults, if there was high EMF readings. Um, For goodness sake, might as well even try the Geiger counter if anyone had something (laughs) handy. (laughs) Um, Because... There is something weird about the atmosphere of the place as witnessed by enough people to make it interesting and to make it a sort of catalyst for strange things happening. Mm. So the case, the cage stands as a fascinating place, even though it's had some very dodgy photographs in the press, which are undoubtedly paradolia or other things like that. Now, the real twist in the tale is, of course, lockups. There isn't a lockup in the country that goes beyond about 1780. And as far as we've approximately managed to age the cage part of the lockup, it's probably early 19th century. Mm. Um, It was a lockup by itself that actually got built on and attached to a very small property, probably in the early 1970s. I say that because I've seen photographs um, uh, of the cage separate from the house with registration, with car registrations of a certain age passing by. So you can say, obviously, it wasn't converted to the house before that date. Now, all that makes the folklore of it being a place where Ursula Kemp, a famous 16th century witch, was locked up in, very tenuous indeed. Mm. Um, in fact, the only connection seems to be this weird plaque that was probably added when it got converted in the 1970s, probably by somebody that had a very approximate knowledge of history because Ursula Kemp was a real witch and was 
quite famous in the area and did unfortunately get hung. Uh, when I say a real witch, she was a herbalist or what have you. So mm. you've got the cage, the haunted witch's prison of the cage St. Joseph's, uh, which almost certainly never had a witch present. Um, just like you've got the black monk of Pontefract that never had a black monk present. Um, uh, and possibly you've got Enfield, which never had the um, uh, the gentleman talking about periods present either. Nevertheless, the phenomena appears to be real. So I'd actually put the cage in the same category as those other two famous cases. Mm-hmm. I think it, it, it's often, as we said at the beginning of our conversation, John, sometimes it's difficult to sort of unpick these mashed histories that have that have been sort of accepted by the locals in a particular area. They'll always tell you that particular story. I mean, I've spoken to several people. Ruth Roper Wilde is a prime example of... Oh, yes, I've, I've met her, yeah. Of, ...of an author who likes to, for better or for worse, she she destroys <laughs> plenty of these ghost stories, John, as we were saying at the beginning, because they are, some of them are just, they've been told for so long that... If you find the truth, it, it it doesn't match what's what's supposed to go on, or or you have specific um, weird little annual events where, which is something we seem to have gotten away from as, as well, where people would say, oh, if you go to a certain location on a certain date, you will would you would see a, a spectre or a or a stone tape theory replay of something occurring again and again and again. So it's difficult, I think, sometimes for people to completely unpick certain stories because often the the Hollywood version, without blaming Hollywood for some of these particular stories, John, seems to be more popular with, with certain people. The Winchester Mansion is a prime example of of the, the version that often gets repeated was completely made up in the 1930s and yet people think that's why the house it, it was built like it was, which it wasn't. It fell down during an earthquake. Um, <laughs> and so it's, that's why some, some parts of it don't make any sense. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. But it is actually great fun trying to find the original source of the yes. tale. I'll, 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 agree with, I'll, I'll agree with Ruth Ripperwild and that. Um, it's, it, it is something I spe- – I, I probably these days spend a lot more time um, uh, researching than I do spending the night in the dark. It's actually yes. it, it's actually quite fascinating to find out where the stories came from and whether whether there's an element of truth in the actual story, but then to actually find um, the phenomena still seems to exist and be real. Um, it's not always the case. Some places are just simply not haunted that are supposed to be haunted. But um, uh, but there's quite a few that have no correlation to the real story, but nevertheless um, still seem to have phenomena. I think before I ask you about your future projects, John, and, and obviously you've alluded to a, to a new book coming down the line in the near future, I can't really talk about Poltergeist without touching on one of my favorites which i have no idea if this event has any basis in reality but when it comes to infamous cases a talking mongoose is usually at the top of the list john because i have a love of poltergeists and also of people who have encounters with animal spirits or or people see the ghosts of departed pets or things like that for me, it's my perfect storm of, of weird phenomenon. Do you think that Geff or Jeff, depending on how you want to pronounce it, is one of those weird stories that is just too strange to be true? or Because it's just full of such wonderful little oddities that, as we've said a couple of times, even if it's not true, it is a remarkably amusing and interesting case. I would say, I would say, Geff or Jeff, mongoose or weasel, because he started <laughs> off as a weasel, yes. um, uh, is taken at evidential value one of our better poltergeist cases. Uh, now, Harry Price got a lot of flack for investigating a talking mongoose. <laughs> Quick aside. Lots of um, uh, famous 
our recorded poltergeist cases in Eastern Europe are derided because all this poltergeist type activity was put down to vampires mm-hmm. who obviously have a part of Eastern European folklore but not Western European folklore for various complicated reasons I won't go into tonight. Yes. Um, uh, now, um, now, should we, because they are portrayed as a vampire, even though the vampire tends to make howling noises through pots and pans and um, uh, so on and so on. That's, uh, that's a recorded case in Greece from memory mm-hmm. where that happened. Um, uh, should we discount them or is that just the way the they people express them? I mean, for goodness sake, we've got a black monk in the 1950s council house up in up in um, Pontefract, um, uh, which we seem to take quite seriously. Uh, so why are we deriding poor old Geff? <laughs> I mean, Geff was a entity that threw things around, um, made things move from place to place, um, uh, had tiny footsteps, from memory, and um, uh, made strange noises and occasionally audibly communicated. I mean, the only reason we deride Geff is because a 13-year-old girl decided it was a mongoose after thinking it was a weasel. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, was Geff a mongoose? Of course he wasn't. (laughs) 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 <laughs> was Geff a poltergeist um, uh, either the catalyst for a 13 year old girl or even caused by a 13 year old girl um, it's, actually, it's actually a very good case I'm not going to say yes or no to that because um, uh, unfortunately when I tried to visit it uh, as I well knew um, uh, every brick of that house has been pulled down but at this, um, the only thing I showed apart from taking a wrong turning and getting very wet um, uh, but sort of knee deep in mud was um, the fact that this is probably not a is a very strange place to bring up a young teenager, um, and a young teenager is going to conjure up invisible friends, possibly, and possibly even conjure up the powers that might create poltergeist activity. Mm. So. I love Geff. Yes. I'm a great fan of Geff. And um, uh, I, I, I would divide anyone that would say something is too paranormal uh, to be investigated because, as I said before, there is always a scientist that would say that your paranormal is too silly to be investigated in the first place. Yes. I, I, I also think, as you probably gathered, that we name our ghosts to fit the narr- to, to fit a simple narrative, they're probably very rarely Anne Boleyn or, yes. or or what have you, but it doesn't mean that there isn't phenomena, and it doesn't mean it's not caused by something. Yeah, I mean it's the thing as well because it never changed the story. She was absolutely convinced until the day yeah. she died that it, it it had happened. So, I mean, it's one of those. I mean, because we've seen this as we as we mentioned Enfield earlier, the the girls from that particular case as they've grown up, I don't think they've spoken publicly now for about 15 years because they just want to let it go. They came out briefly. It was probably less than 15. uh, They came out out briefly for paid interviews for the Conjuring um, movie. And, I mean, I've, I've got no problems with people getting a fee for being interviewed by television. I mean, you know, it's some, uh, you know, if I get interviewed by television, I think it's quite nice if they you know, pay me a small fee. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have nothing against that per se. But, yes, they're not – I think they – they don't want to be associated with it. They want to lead lead their own lives. But yes, um, the they still fundamentally stick to their stories. So mm-hmm. they're they're definitely consistent. And if the stories were just reliant on two 
two young teenagers. One could possibly put a lot more skepticism on it, but um, uh, it's reliant on one very experienced investigator, one first-time investigator, actually, in the nice. guise of Morris Gross, who was nevertheless a very clever inventor who had just retired, mm. and um, uh, lots of outsiders, including police officers and so on. Um, so it would take some unpicking to say this was either simply fraud or simply imagination. Um, anyone that simply says that is actually trying to invent a theory which is probably more complicated than the theory of a poltergeist. Yes. Yes, as always, especially Enfield, John is one of those cases where people say, oh, well, they got caught faking stuff. And therefore, everything else that was recorded by Morris and Guy was trickery. And yet, they don't talk about the sliding chairs or the cushion flying onto the ceiling mm. or the fireplace being ripped out of the wall or the noises occurring in next door's house or the, the numerous other incidents that were witnessed by numerous people Daily Mirror, BBC, police, they just go, I think people go, oh, well, there were two girls in it. They were just mucking about. And that with, and once you start to look at everything else, you think, well, if, if these girls were that talented, why on earth were they stuck in a council house in Enfield? They should have been on television. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, yes, and I also I, I also have um, uh, a little bit more tolerance for two young girls, possibly playing tr plank pranks once or twice, um, as opposed to, say, I'd have uh, one of the famous mediums of the past who was caught fraudulently and so on. I, I think we have to keep the bar a little bit lower for them um, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to a medium being caught. I would want something pretty special to prove they weren't faking it all the time, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah. um, uh, but I think the bar should be kept a little bit lower for, you know, two 13, 13 year old girls. Mm -hmm. Well, your last book was a, was a wonderful collection and investigation in regards to this wonderful phenomenon, John. And as you've referred to, you've, you've got another iron in the fire. So can you shed any light on your, on your further upcoming project? Um, yeah, certainly. I'll do that in a second. Um, just going back to something we were saying earlier on, um, we, we mentioned that a lot of people's experience of um, ghost hunting was through, um, you know, obviously the slightly one-dimensional programs of our own television. And just in case um, there's anyone that's been enticed by those slightly one-dimensional programs, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, there are three, there's lots of um, uh, local um, uh, paranormal investigation groups of some of good quality, some of not such good quality. But there's also three, um, just to get it in the context, because we've talked about these organizations earlier, the three national organizations through which um, if people want to take it a little bit more seriously, they'd, uh, they'd um, uh, be well worth looking at, possibly. Um, first is the Ghost Club, which um, uh, which has been existing on and off since 1863, um, which is thriving at the moment. Um, uh, it is a very good entry and has a lot of good speakers, does some investigations, but it's probably probably was started as being a for people that wanted to discuss the paranormal and mm. is very much um, uh, still in that vein. Um, anytime they have a speaker, they have um, plenty of time afterwards to meet and socialize. And that works extremely effectively in what it intends to do. Mm. There is also ASAP, which is a brilliant concept in, in, that came around in the 1980s, trying to bring all the various phenomena together, like the ghost club, well, primarily ghosts and so on. Now, um, ASAP investigates everything from UFOs to ghosts to poltergeists to reincarnation um, and tries to bring the whole field together. Um, it has a wonderful annual conference. It's having another one in September, I believe. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to get more interested, that's no bad way of doing it. Um, slightly more academic, but um, uh, but 
none the worse for that, is the Society of Psychical Research, of which I'm a member of the council at the moment. Um, it has excellent contacts with universities and um, actually can call on resources of um, university psychologists, physicists, and so on to to um, uh, really try to get a connection with ghost hunting or paranormal investigating becoming a serious science. Um, it also has a, an excellent... Um, an excellent academic journal and an excellent magazine that's less academic. And I think all three of these groups actually do 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 something slightly different for the paranormal community. And depending on what you want, um, I would f thoroughly recommend you join one or more of them. I'm actually a member of all three. <laughs> but that was just in just in case people were intrigued but didn't know where to go next. But um, uh, talking about where to go next, um, yes, um, apparently I have another book coming out, um, probably early twenty twenty four, um, which has the working title of uh. My Paranormal Life, One Big Box of Paranormal Tricks, question mark. <laughs> um, now, the first part of the the, – the reason, the reason it's got quite a long lead time is this is actually a fascinating series um, which has been devised by John Hunt Publishing, um, which um, under the six book imprint, um, which will not just include my paranormal life, but include the paranormal life of various other people. Um, one, a ghost investigator that comes from a different angle. Um, another um, uh, is a psychic medium. And um, I believe um, somebody who has good contacts with the Hollywood stars is also um, uh, doing his interpretation of um, uh, uh, their paranormal experiences and how it affected him. Now, first thing is it is not an autobiography. That would be pompous. I'm probably not that famous. <laughs> and... Um, uh, it's uh, not something one would care to I, I would care to indulge in it's more a kind of meditation of what the paranormal means to me my of my possible overall theory of what it all means and how I got there during X number of years of, of investigating with quite a lot of fun along the way um it's um uh, called one big box of paranormal tricks because possibly just possibly i'm thinking there might i've been hinting at connections between um uh, hypnotism past life regression spiritualist experiments experiences ouija birds poltergeists and what have you i'm mm. kind of wondering to myself whether there is just kind of one paranormal power that we express in different ways be it through, you know, um, there's all the cultural differences. Um, some people, some people would describe it as vampires. Some people would describe it as mongooses, um, <laughs> uh, and so on. And it's kind of, it's kind of a amusing, a, hopefully an interesting short book as to how I get there. Um, and it's only a hypothesis. And um, uh, the interesting experiences I had over the years that kind of gradually brought me to that conclusion. So that's well, as a project, that's that's done. It's just um, uh, just obviously because it's a um, uh, a series of books. We're just waiting for the whole series to be complete so we can have a have a launch of um, more than one title at a time. But um, uh, I'd look out for that. Even if mine doesn't interest you, I'm sure one of the other ones will. Um, <laughs> over and above that, I'm still active on the Spontaneous Cases Committee of the Society for Psychical Research. And um, uh, 
I hope in the near future to get a very interesting case to follow up on. Yes. Well, I was going to ask you about that before I let you go, because obviously I think when I've spoken to some people, there seems to be this perception these days, John, rightly or wrongly, that poltergeist cases don't happen anymore, or we don't have any great hauntings. Because I think, once again, people's opinions or or views on the subject have been skewed by entertainment television over the last 20 years. But clearly they are still going on. And as we were talking about the the cage contacting you guys first, Mm. rather than going to the television, do you think that people are still contacting the SPR in regards to helping or requesting an investigation without going forwards with the publicity because of what's happened in previous cases, as we've, as we've touched on in regards to say Geff and Enfield and and, and others of that ilk. Um, Well, first, first of all, what is the similarity between the cage, the Enfield case, Burley Rectory, and for that matter, Geff, they all contacted the media. Um, uh, The, Poltergeist cases only exist in the public eye to the extent that people wish to contact the media. Mm. Um, Otherwise, they either remain in the dusty archives of local groups or, in some cases, the SPR. Now, the SPR probably doesn't have quite the monopoly of, you know, monopoly of cases that it used to because there's so many other groups around. Um, But... If I, if I said um, uh, we're currently investigating a very interesting poltergeist case, uh, some of my colleagues are, I might well get involved in it as well, um, which who turned down one of the television shows because they're not interested in that element of publicity, it would probably answer your question as to mm. why we don't um, have so many... We don't, all, we don't publicly have poltergeist cases, it, you need first to have a case that somebody wants to publicize in the first place. Um, otherwise, it goes totally under the radar of all these lovely television shows and so on. No, I'd say I'd say poltergeist cases are just as common as they used to be. Um, I'd also say it's true the SPR doesn't get as many because there are hundreds of groups up there out there who have their own internet site and people might contact them. I know a lot of good researchers outside the SPR that have low-level and high-level poltergeist cases. Um, So, yes, no, the poltergeist is very alive and well. Good. (laughs) Just um, uh, might not read about it in the Daily Mirror. Yeah. <laughs> so what what does it involve and entail then being part of the spontaneous cases committee John what 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 does that entail what do you do Basically um uh, if um, if if there's a communication um from a member of the public um uh, quite a lot of them are historic and we will um just give our interpretation of them a little bit of helpful advice and um and note it and look for any correlations um uh some are photographs which we will try and give an explanation of um others are others the minority but um are um, are ongoing cases in which we will try and send out a if we can a couple of people to try to investigate further and make sense of what's going on um mm. And um, it's probably about, uh, about, I think we've got about 12 members at the moment. And we would also use as other people as and when required within the SPR. Um, all cases are treated as um, uh, anonymous unless, unless explicitly told otherwise. And um, so if we did report, make any reports, it would be, Mr. X in town Y yeah. having this that, and that, which isn't very good for um, uh, reading, but is essential because the needs of the needs of the um, uh, the people who are having the happenings need to come first, even over and above, even over and above um, the investigation side of it. Um, I'll give you a quick example, actually, 
very old Ghost Scout Club investigation I did probably about 20 years ago. Um, we had a haunted council flat. Um, uh, single mother again, who was um, basically getting pushed around by a poltergeist. Um, that was, and um, we actually, after investigating it for a while, helped her approach the council along with her member of parliament. Um, uh, got some very grand looking Gus Club um, founded 1863 note paper out and wrote a letter to the council saying, whatever the truth of the matter, we are convinced that this lady um, is believes believes in her experiences and therefore would 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 do much better in a separate in a different council flat. Now she'd actually been upgraded from one bedroom to a two bedroom, so this wasn't what she was after, if you know. I mean she'd already mm. um she'd already got her her council flat that she wanted. But believe it or not, I don't know if it was a, if it was our MP or us, but we actually got her transferred. End of mm. case, we can't. Uh, would have been unprofessional to kind of send a letter, have you been seeing the poltergeist? Yeah. <laughs> um, funnily enough, um, in the research we did, the previous tenant had seen some very strange things. We, we got a lot of witness testimony from the neighbours. Uh, but um, uh, obviously you don't do that because it might, it might scare somebody and that's not what the... Primarily, investi- pri- primarily, we would love to find a place to investigate personally, but from an ethical point of view, the needs of the person who is having the phenomenon needs to come first. And the best way I've ever encapsulated that was doing our small bit to get this lady transferred. Yeah. It was a equally very similar two-bedroom flat. Um, no, no advantage to her in the accommodation, but very big advantage to her in peace of mind. Win-win for everybody then, Jim. Win-win for everybody. Apart from maybe the next tenants. <laughs> well. But we'll I'm never sure. know. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is, there is always that. Yes, yes. Intriguing. For, uh, makes you wonder. Just just whenever you might get that next next goal, you go, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not again. Oh. Well, John, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you finally after after admiring your work for 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 a while so where can everybody find your books and uh, have you any online presences they can find and follow you on oh um books wise amazon poltergeist john fraser um uh, don't try doing the long title it takes too much typing it comes up as poltergeist <laughs> john fraser no problems i do not have a website per se I can be contacted via the SPR. I'm quite happy to share my Twitter if anyone wanted to contact me via via Twitter if they have anything interesting or have anything interesting to add to the debate. All I all I would say is um, uh, anyone that says they know what paranormal phenomena is is doing it from a purely belief led. Um, basis. I have my own theories, but I'm more than happy to have them, you know, proved and discussed. And if if it comes to that, proved wrong. So mm-hmm. it's um, uh, that's what I love about the paranormal. It's one of life's last great mysteries. It certainly is. Well, I'll put links to everything in the show notes as we've discussed for ASAP, the SPR, and the Ghost Club. Mm. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to finally have a chance to speak with you, John, and I hope to get the chance to speak to you again in future because it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure appearing on your show. <laughs>